you know, the nature of the believer's resurrection body is, uh, it's not an easy thing to grasp. And I think that this is one of the reasons why people have trouble, um, why, why people struggle with uh, receiving what the text actually has to say in regards to the difference between texts that speak of the resurrection as a fact, you will be raised, you will have a resurrection body, and texts that describe the nature of the believer's resurrection body. And so what we're talking about today in our title, as we go rather long text, but as we go from verses 42 through 57, we're going to talk about asking the question, what is the nature of your resurrection body? What is the nature of it? We're going to talk about the nature of our resurrection body and compare it to our earthly body, our earthly body. This is what Paul does here in the 15th chapter. And secondly, as you look at your outline, he'll talk about the nature of your resurrection body compared to Christ. We're seeing a difference here. There's a difference between the type of resurrection body that you will have and the body that you're living in now. There's a difference. And the fact that he makes a comparison between the two just, you know, expands that difference. And then he'll talk about how our resurrection body as it is compared to Christ. Well, what about Christ's current resurrected state? is that in which we will share, because we will share in some of that. That's a part of the nature of our bodies out of heaven. And then thirdly, we'll talk about the nature of our resurrection body and what happens when you get it. And I think that uh, might be one of the more exciting uh, passages in this, in this location that we're dealing with today. What happens when you get it, you see? When you die as a believer, you've heard me talk about this before, when you die as a, as a believer, you put off this physical, earthly, carbon-based body, and your spirit goes into the heavenly realm, but it doesn't go in naked. That's like Paul said to the Corinthians, lest we should be naked. We don't want to be naked. We want to be clothed with our body, he says, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, which is in heaven and which comes to us from out of heaven, see, and that that is the eternal body, it says, that comes to us. All right, wonderful. So at the point of our death, since Christ has returned in A.D. 70, and since 1 Corinthians 15, 23, already, which we've already looked at, tells us that the resurrection body and the event of the resurrection happens at his parousia, which was expected to take place with the destruction of the temple in Matthew 24 in A.D. 70 during that first century generation, that with that taking place... Anybody who is in Christ that dies, leaves this body since A.D. 70, is immediately clothed with their body from out of heaven, just like all of the believers were um, uh, who were alive at that point. At that point, when the resurrection took place at the parousia, when they would die, they would immediately have their body. Those who had already passed, who had already died prior to A.D. 70, were in the heavenly realm, uh, Hebrews 12, uh, verse 22 and 23 talks about that, that you have come to the righteous made perfect in heaven, righteous men and women. Paul talked about in Philippians, the first, ha- uh, first chapter, the fact that it is better for me to depart this life and be with Christ, not to be in Sheol or in to, be, uh, to be in some area in a holding tank of some sort, but to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Well, how would I be with Christ? Well, at that time, at that time, you wouldn't get your resurrection body until the parousia along with the resurrection would take place. So now since then, anybody that's in Christ that dies immediately goes into that state. I believe the New Testament teaches that it puts us right into that out of earthly time um, um, placement where we find ourselves with all of the believers from all history and all time together in a timeless realm, timeless realm, which is of course what the heavenly realm is, where we find ourselves at the parousia, experiencing the resurrection, having our bodies put on over and we are clothed with it. And that's, that's where we're, we're, we're functioning today in regards to the text that we're looking at and teaching from. So what is the nature of our resurrection body? Let's read these first few verses, starting at verse 42, takes us down to verse 49. This will be the first point here. Verse 42 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. 
Paul says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also will bear the image of the heavenly. Now, I would say those first couple of verses, 42 and 43, and probably 44 also, are probably the main passages that most of the church has looked at and come to a quick conclusion without taking other passages that speak about the nature of the believer's resurrection body into consideration. It is these couple of verses that says, for instance, uh, sown a perishable body, raised an imperishable body. See right there, it says we will be raised. Well, that's a statement of fact. We will be raised. But Paul, as we have already discovered, has already given us the definition of what it means to be raised. Anybody remember where that verse is? It's verse 38. God says, God gives it a body, gives it a body, just as he wished or desired, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. This is part of that illustration last week where I, I had that hymnal in my hand. I, I used Mary as the example, and I'm holding onto this hymnal, and I'm saying, now here it is. Here's the resurrection body. Do you have it yet, right? Do you have it? Well, no, you don't have it yet. Until It's not until I give it to you. I know it's overly simplistic, but it's not until I give it to you, and it's in your hands that you actually have it. So then how can your resurrection body be this carbon-based body? You've already got it right now, but it's... Verse 38 says that God still has to give it to you. God still has to give it to you. So it's something other than this earthly carbon-based body. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 2, is so important that our bodies are in heaven and they come to us from out of heaven. Critical, critical, critical. And so based on that, he continues in this genre. So now look at verse 42, and let's consider first that this resurrection body is certainly imperishable. We're going to be comparing now the resurrection body to the earthly body, and that will show that the nature of the resurrection body cannot be this earthly body. That's why he makes this comparison. So verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Now those first two opening words, so also, point back really to verses 39 through 41, where there is that aspect of environment that's brought to our minds. The bodies of the earth-dwelling people, beasts, fish, and this kind of a thing in verse 39, that these bodies are made to inhabit the environment that they will live in, see? Uh, the environment is not made for, for the body. It's the reverse of that. And so he emphasizes the fact that in, this is where he's going when he gets to verse 50, that when we come into the heavenly realm, then that which is perishable, our earthly carbon bodies, can't inherit or go into the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood can't go in. See? So that why? Because the heavenly realm kingdom of God uh, is an environment that mandates that we have a body that exists within it. That's why I said to you last week, I wonder if there's oxygen in, in the kingdom of God or in the heavenly spiritual realm. You know, it, maybe that question doesn't really matter or not, but it sort of makes you think a little bit like we have lungs, you know, so we can survive within our environment here on the earth. A fish has gills, so that they can survive underwater. You take them out of that watery environment and they die. So flesh and blood, verse 50, is the same idea. Flesh and blood, then, cannot survive within the environment of the heavenly spiritual realm or kingdom of God. So when he says, so also, he's referring back to this area of environment, okay? So also is the resurrection of the dead or resurrection of the dead ones, it says in Greek. 
and then he explains, it is sown a perishable body. Well, that's no good. A body that is sown that is perishable, and we, the word sown again, that brings us back to verse 36. Look at 36. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And then 37, very important. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be. Now that's critical, isn't it? I mean, that's explanative right there. You do not sow the body that is to be. So a body, carbon-based body, that goes into the tomb, goes into the sea, goes into the ground, whatever like that, is not the body that will be. What is our problem? Really, I mean really. What is our problem all this time in the, in the church? Well, it's like what I said at the very beginning when I was introducing this uh, to us. It's a tough subject. We can't really say... You know, over in 1 John, John says, you know, what we shall be, we don't really know what we're going to be. 1 John, the third chapter. We don't really know what we're going to be. He was saying that at that point. Paul is expressing to us um, as much information as the Holy Spirit is granting for him to give to us at that time. And yet John is over here in 1 John 3 saying, what we will be is really not absolutely known. It just... It just really isn't. And we want to know. See, this is our problem. We want to know. We want to know what the heck, right? So when you take away from somebody, um, you know, it's like what you've been accused of and I've been accused of before when you present the biblical teaching of preterism, Christ returning in A.D. 70 to that first century generation as he taught, uh, well, you come to that and people say, well, you know, you're taking away my hope, my blessed hope out of Titus 2, verse 13, right? You're taking that away. No, I'm not taking it. I can't take anything away. I'm just showing you what the text says right here. You have put on yourself that this thing has to be such an absolute that you have to experience that. You've been told this and told this and told this, see? So that now when you don't experience, then people's entire Christian lives are based upon experiencing this rapture thing or experiencing the second coming in some way and it's been drilled and drilled and drilled to us that when we finally come to the conclusion that there is no Bible that says we're going to experience what other preachers have taught us for the last 2,000 years, that when we come to that we feel kind of ripped off because we insist on having this experience and you're not going to have it. You're not going to have it. Sorry. It's not for you to have. It was for that first first century generation to go through. And so, if the resurrection of the dead in 42 is sown a perishable body, body, it is raised an imperishable body. Now, remember last week I said to you, every time you see that word raised right here in 42, 43, 44, for instance, I got verse 38 written right next to that. Verse 38, because that is Paul's working definition of what the resurrection of the dead ones is. It's God giving you a body and to each of the seeds a body of its own. Why does he have to do that? Why does he have to give you a body? Because verse 37 says that the body that is sown is not the body that shall be. So he's got to give you a body. That's where 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2 comes in. Our body that is eternal is in the heavens and it comes to us from out of the heavens and it clothes our disembodied, saved, regenerate spirit. And so he says at the bottom of 42, when the resurrection of the dead ones happens, instead of it being a perishable body, it is raised what kind of a body? An imperishable body. It doesn't perish. It doesn't corrupt. It doesn't fade away. It's imperishable, see? It's imperishable because of verse 38. God gives you a body, and that body that he gives you doesn't perish. That body that he gives you doesn't corrupt. It doesn't go into the ground and flake off. 43 now brings us into the idea from the resurrection body that is imperishable to the resurrection body that is glorious and powerful. As opposed to what? Well, as opposed to a body that is not glorious and powerful. Look at 43. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Now, the words dishonor and weakness have to do with which body? 
Yeah, your physical, I say carbon-based, that sets it apart pretty well right there. Your earthly carbon-based body. All right, it, it is uh, sown in dishonor. There's nothing honorable about this body without the spirit and the soul inside of it. Now remember what the difference is. <sighs> Catch my breath. The Old and the New Testament speaks about the soul and the spirit as the spirit being your personality. That's your saved self. That's the part of you that's regenerate. Your soul is that which uh, abides within your blood, Leviticus 17.11, which I'm going to refer to again a little bit later, that the life or the soul of the flesh is in the blood. You see, that's why when somebody loses their blood, let's say in an accident something happens and they begin to drain away their blood, that they begin to die. Well, because the soul or the life, the nefesh in Hebrew, is in the blood. That's why when you lose your blood, you die physically because it's the soul that animates your physical body. It's the soul that animates this, that you and I are sitting here in and are looking, our eyes are working, our hearts are pumping, this kind of a thing. That's the soul at work. And the body is obviously you know, what it is. So now, 43, it is sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. Now watch this. Watch this. Right where it says sown in glory, right? Uh, Romans 8 and verse 18, you should look at that. Just write it down and I'll read it to you, okay? Romans 8 and verse 18. Paul says in Romans 8, 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, in the first century, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is, melo, about to be revealed, literally, in us. It's ace, the Greek word, in us. Notice it again. The sufferings of this present time not worthy to compare with the glory that is about to be revealed in us. And then he begins to speak about the ketesis, the creation in verse 19. The creation here, as it is described, is not about the physical brute creation. It's about people. It's about saved mankind. And we are referred to as new creations, 2 Corinthians 5.17, in Christ, are we not? New creations. There are other passages that the Greek word katesis for creation is used to describe you and I in Christ. And that's what this is talking about right here, but I'm not going to take the time to go through that. I am tempted to do so, but I will not. So you look back now at, at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 43. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. Now watch. But it is raised in power. Verse 38. God gives it a body, and to each of the seeds, a body of its own, a powerful body. It is a body that, ha that is able to live in the environment of the spiritual heavenly realm. And it has to be powerful, because the kingdom of heaven is a powerful environment. It is an environment for the saints of God who have been empowered to be judges, as we have been studying in our Revelation class on Wednesday nights, and as we've been looking at in Daniel, the seventh chapter, verse verse 18, verse 22, verse 27, and that whole arena right there, okay? This is a powerful kingly environment, and you and I are given assignment based upon how we come out of the, the bema tithe, the bema seat, the judgment seat, judgments. Based upon that, we are rewarded with further responsibility. In order to bring about that responsibility of ruling and reigning with Christ, we have to be powerful people. And you know what that means? I don't know. I don't. I don't know what it means. I can't find anything that tells me what it means. It just says it. It's raised in power for the, for the means of being able to minister in accordance with the way Christ wants us to minister in the heavenly realm. So it cannot be this body. This earthly physical body will not sustain the element of heavenly power that is given to us that we might be whom Christ has called us to be in the heavenly realm. <laughs> We're just all going to have to find out together. It is raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power. So that's the resurrection body that is glorious and powerful, which then thirdly brings us in our sub-point here of the main point to the resurrection body that is a spiritual body. Uh, verse 44 now with me. Ready? 
It is sown a natural body. It is raised, verse 38, it is raised a spiritual body. <clears throat> natural body, sukikon in Greek. It's an adjective, soulish. It's a soulish. It is, it says, sown a soulish body. It is of the soul. That which keeps your body and your feet rolling, like I just got through describing to you. But that's for this earth. That's so you can occupy your existence right now on this carbon-based uh, creatorship so that you can live it out now on the earth. You have to have a soulish body, empowered to be in this earthly environment, you see. So it is sown that way, soulish. You might want to write down Leviticus 17.11, right next to verse 44 right there. See where it says it is sown a natural body? I put Leviticus 17.11 right about there. Let me, now that I, I kind of quoted it to you a little bit earlier, but let me, let me just, let me just read the whole verse to you. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now the word life there is nephesh in Leviticus 17.11. Life is nephesh. It's the equivalent of the soul. It's the Hebrew word for soul. For the, so we could read it. For the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar. He's talking about the sacrificial system here. To make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood. It is the blood by reason of the soul that makes atonement. And it goes, it's very interesting, the entire context right here. But just the beginning of that right there. The life or the soul of the flesh is in the blood. It's in animal blood. It's in, it's in human blood. It's the same thing that's going on right there. So when you look back at 1 Corinthians 15, 44, it is sown a soulish body. See? That, that soulish body has to go into the ground. That means it dies. Verse 30, what? 7, right? No, let's do th 36. You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. So what is sown has to die. So we're talking about a body uh, that dies. And the spirit is now unclothed because the spirit is loosed from the body. He goes on to say in 44, not only is it sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. Now watch this. This is, this is fascinating. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now the Greek would better read this way. If there is, the Greek word for is there is estin. You could put it in English characters as E-S-T-I-N. E-S-T-I-N. If there is, now estin or estin normally is translated by the word exist, exist. So he says, if there exists a natural body, and there does, you're in it right now, yes? If there exists a natural body, there is or exists also a spiritual body. In other words, simultaneously. What does this make you think of? If there is a spiritual body that exists simultaneously along with your earthly body while you're in it on this earth, what's that referring to? What is that body that exists simultaneously with your earthly body referring to? There you go. Bing, 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 bing. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. That's it right there. The body that exists in heaven and comes from out of heaven, right? So it exists simultaneously. That's why well, I told you about that joke. The guy thought he was being funny where he says to me, oh, great. So you're, you know, he didn't believe what I was telling him about the resurrection body. He says, great. So it's kind of like your body's like on this giant heavenly hanger up in the heavenly closet up in heaven. And I said, yeah. Yeah, sure, what the heck? Yeah, that works just fine for me. It's waiting for me. It comes to me from out of heaven. Look, that's what the text says. You know, you can try to gun it all you want. You can make it sound like something other than it is, so, you know, you can sort of dilapidate it so it's like somehow not true. But the fact of the matter is, is that that's what the text says in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. So, verse 44, if there exists a natural body, there exists also a spiritual one. The word body is not there, but it's certainly implied in the context. 
So we see that. It is, it is part and parcel of what you will receive out of heaven. So this is the nature of your resurrection body compared to the earthly body. This brings us to the second point right now, second point on your outline, and this is the nature now of your resurrection body compared to Christ. Now he's going to spend time comparing our resurrection body with the body that Jesus, the Messiah, was raised in and currently inhabits. Now, our bodies are not exactly the same as Christ, but there are similarities but it's not 100% uh, the same across the board. So consider verse 45, your resurrection body is spiritual like Christ, 45, so also it is written, and he quotes now out of Genesis 2-7, Genesis 2-7, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That's fascinating. Last Adam, who would that be? Christ became a life-giving spirit. Now watch this. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. Now that's, that's coming right out of the creation narrative of Adam in Genesis, the second chapter. It's directly from the seventh verse right here. Uh, how did he become a living soul? How did Adam become a living soul? Well, God took his body took it of, it says dust of the ground, it also means the idea of wet clay, okay, in the Hebrew. And God took the wet clay of the dirt of the earth. See, you're just, when you get dirty outside, you just got more of you on top of you, more of the dirt, on, you know. And he takes this, he takes this, this Play-Doh, and he just begins to squeeze it, yatsar. It's squeezed together, and it's molded, and he makes the body. See, God's hands-on in regards to, to Adam. And then in order for him to become a living soul, what does God have to do? Excellent. God breathes into him the breath of life and he becomes this living soul. That's where he got his animation from and that's where you get your physical animation from, also known as the soul. You know why I can move around on this whole kind of a thing? It's because God breathed into Adam and that's been passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down, and all of us have it. It all has its origins. All of our souls have their origins in the garden. That's the only explanation for it. That's the only explanation for it, see? So the first man, verse 45, became a living soul. Now, the last Adam then becomes a life-giving spirit. Now, Jesus is not a bodiless spirit. Interesting. He has a spirit with a body. Remember Luke 40, uh, 24, where he meets the boys. It's Resurrection Sunday, right? And it's the evening now. And they're all in the, in the upper room and they're gathered together and the doors are locked, right? And then Jesus stands in the midst of them saying peace to them. And they freak out and they say, ah, it's a ghost, it's a ghost, right? And he says, no, listen, come here, touch me, feel me. A spirit does not have flesh and bones, ah, as you see I have. So he's got a body. He says, you got anything to eat? They give him some fish. Nom, 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 nom. It's all gone. He's in a body, right? But now Paul adds to this, and he says that the last Adam became or went into a life-giving, zoopoieo in Greek, zoopoieo, life-giving, life-making, if you will, spirit with a body. All right, what is life-giving here? Once again, it's verse 38. Life-giving, 38, but God gives it a body just as he wishes, and to each of the seeds he gives a body of its own. This is the verse 45, life-giving aspect of Christ. He gives this resurrection body. Back up to verse 44. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there exists a natural body, there also exists a spiritual body. This is how he becomes the zoopoieo, the life-making, or in this case, the life-giving spirit. 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Why? Because of verse 36, verse 36 you fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. You must be born naturally into this earth first. Then, 
then you put off this soul-driven body and you put on over that the body out of heaven, which is Christ-like, which is glorified, which is powerful, which is imperishable, which is spiritual. He says in 47, the first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man, Christ, is from heaven. Oh, just like your resurrection body is from heaven, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. That 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2 just keeps hammering and hammering and hammering and hammering. You know, it's so tenacious. You know, it, it, it's like a bloodhound, right? It just won't give up. It just won't go away. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the reason that, the reason that we have um, established doctrine within, let's say, the Reformed Church, historically, is because we've already had synods and councils that have come together to establish things like the nature of the Trinity, the Council of Nicaea, uh, Council of Chalcedon, Council of Orange. Um, we've had all these and others come together and establish. That doesn't make them 100% right, because they're not. They make mistakes. All right, but generally speaking, that's why in our bylaws, for instance, uh, you become a member of Messiah Church, you're also agreeing with the bylaws, and the bylaws tell, tell us that uh, as part of the Reformed, um, the reformed movement uh, that, we're, that we're a part of, going back to the Reformation period, we take hold of the Westminster Confession of Faith as, as our participation or our participatory confession of doctrine that we hold to uh, together. It's not perfect. I take exceptions to a few things here and there. So do you, you know, in regards to that. And you hear more of it when somebody becomes uh, an elder here in our church well, unlike, unlike a, a, the average church member of Messiah, an elder is expected to hold to certain things more strongly, more definitely, and part of it has to do with holding to the Westminster Confession. You can't just blow the whole thing off because that puts you outside of the Reformed tradition. We do have tradition in the church. Uh, it's the Reformed aspect, but it only goes as far as Scripture will validate it. It only goes so far as Scripture will validate it. Otherwise, it won't do that. All right, now here's my point. <clears throat> We've had all of these doctrines settled and established, and you've heard me say this before, but it bears repeating. The one doctrine that has never been established in the church, in the history of the church, is the doctrines concerning eschatology, the timing and the nature of the second coming, the meaning of the resurrection, of the judgments, the nature of these things. Why have they not? See, all men have done is they have taken the futuristic statements, futuristic statements that are made in the, in the New Testament that are, of course, made for the people receiving the epistles like First and Second Corinthians and Thessalonians, Ephesians, Galatians, and all that kind of a thing. When, when those authors make those future to them statements... They ignore, of course, us today. We ignore the, the fact of audience relevancy and the fact that those things are being said that, that that second coming, that resurrection, that experience of the judgment outside of time would happen within the historical framework of the first century. We ignore that and we just transfer it over that we're still waiting for it, we're still waiting for it. Just because it says it's still to happen in the New Testament, you've got to remember you're reading somebody else's mail. You're reading mail that is given to those people in the first century that Jesus and the apostles said would be the ones that would be the generation that would experience those things. Now, today in the church, the reason we've got three, four different views of the millennium, you know, post-millennial, pre-millennial, you know, you've got all kinds of, you've got preterism, you know, you've got the historicist point of view, you know, and so on. Why, are, why do we have all those things? We have them because they've never been established and never been settled through synod and through council like all these other doctrines have. Do you think God would be glorified uh, in, uh, in having us hold on to, you know, three, four different views of justification by faith? Would that be a good thing? How about three or four different views of the humanity and, uh, and, uh, and uh, divinity of Christ, you know? Or the person of the... I mean, we just go on with all of the doctrines. Well, it's not glorifying to God for us to hold on to these different views because that's, that's breeding confusion. Confusion. 
And that's why things are the way they are right now relative to the state of eschatology in the church. These things have not been settled and they need to be settled. And you and I right now are in the realm historically of promoting the settling of this area of eschatology. So in 47 he says, the first man is from the earth, earthy, the second man is from heaven, just like your body. 48, as is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. In other words, heavenly equals the spiritual body. You get the spiritual body. Now 49, I'm going kind of fast because I've chosen to use a lot of text here today. So 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthy. So we have followed in Adam's image, have we not? Yeah. So just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now the key to this verse right here is to understanding the Greek word for born and bear. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, it's phoreo in Greek. Phoreo. Phoreo is the idea of that which goes on over. Some lexicons even use the definition of putting clothes on over the naked body. You see, phoreo. So he says here, just as we have put on over the image of the earthy, that's Adam's image, now watch this, we will also, phoreo, put on over like clothing, the image of the heavenly. Who's the heavenly? That's Christ. We put on over our disembodied spirits like clothing, this body that is given to us, verse 38, from God, which according to verse 37 is not the body that is to be. So what goes into the ground is not the body that gets resurrected is what 37 is saying. Instead, 38, God gives it a body and to each of the seeds a body of its own. It, foreo, it goes on over our disembodied spirits. And once again, there's 2 Corinthians 5, the first two verses again. I love Psalm 17 and verse 15 right here. Psalm 17 and verse 15. It's a favorite the psalmist says, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. I will have on over me the heavenly. By the way, the Hebrew word for likeness here also means embodiment. Embodiment. In Psalm 17 and verse 15, I will be satisfied with your embodiment when I awake. It's a Christ-like body. It's the heavenly body. It's a powerful body. It's an imperishable body, like Paul is trying to describe right here back at 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. So just as we have borne the image of the earthly, put on over our spirits, we have, we're in this physical carbon-based Adamic body right now that God has breathed into through Adam and that gets passed down and that's why we all become living souls in the womb of our mama. We will also bear, put on over the image of the heavenly and that backs up Psalm 17 and verse 15. So that's the first two major points here in your outline as we're moving through this. Now let's catch the third one and then wind this up. Let's now talk about the nature of your resurrection body and what happens when you get it. What happens when I get this body? Oh man, looking at verse 50 now, let's read it on down to verse 57. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's consider back in verses 50 through 52 how it's our resurrection body and the exchange takes place here. Looking at verse 50, and of course I've been making reference to this. He says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood, the human body, cannot inherit, receive, or in this case, own or go into the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable, that's your body, the perishable, that's your body, inherit the imperishable. Well, the imperishable is verse 42. So also is the resurrection dead. It is sown a perishable body. Well, that which is sown, according to verse 37 is not the body that shall be. So, l- l- listen, it's over with, ladies and gentlemen. It's over with. Saying that the resurrection, the believer's resurrection body, is this carbon based Adamic body is just stupid to hold to that. That's just stupid. Yeah, it is. It's stupid because you're staring right into the face of that which is, is contradicting it. It is. You calling people stupid? Yeah, I guess I I am. Sure. If you don't want to be stupid, (laughs) follow what I'm telling you here. People, they're funny. It's like, do you really talk to people like that? Yeah, what are they going to do, fire me? Well, I guess you could fire me. (laughs) You could vote me out. He says, nor does the perishable, the bottom of verse 50, inherit the imperishable. It's talking about the body right there. 51. Behold, I tell you a mysterion, a mystery, a mysterion, that which um, that which uh, was not revealed before but is revealed now is a biblical mystery. Like I've told you before, a biblical mystery is not you know, a Sherlock Holmes mystery in Agatha the Christie novel or something like that. No, it's talking about that which was once hidden or unrevealed that is now revealed. So when Paul or any of the New Testament writers say, I'm going to show you a mystery, he's saying, this has been revealed and you can know what it is. So I tell you this mystery so you can know what this means. We will not all sleep. Paul's euphemism for death. We, Paul himself, the other apostles, those alive in the first century, the Corinthians, we will not all die. He's talking about when this resurrection event occurs. But we will all be changed. Now, we just hit on this last week, didn't we? Alasso is the Greek word. Alasso. The primary meaning for alasso is exchange. And yes, I am exchanging this physical carbon body for the body out of where? Yeah, exactly correct. Good job. Now, I also told you last week that Kittle's Theological Dictionary has just got, it's the Cadillac of of Bible uh, Bible lexicons, uh, Greek lexicons, 10 volumes with an index, you know, and it, it, it comments, it's got an article on this word alasso right there. And I wrote down some information that's down here in, in regards to that. It's from volume 1 and page 251 of Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. To alasso means to give in exchange or to take in exchange. To give in exchange or to take in exchange. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, uh, it's used over in Romans 1, verse 23. It's, that's a good, that's a good uh, passage to just make note of. Romans 1, 23. It's talking about those who profess to be wise. They become fools. 23. And alasso, or exchanged, the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and so forth. That's alasso right there. Exchanged. See? It's the same meaning over here. The only reason it's not given its full weight is because these things 
because there's never been a synod or a council that has come together to settle this matter of eschatology. This is why things are so confused the way they are. Okay, So he goes on to say, we will not all sleep, but we will all be alasso, exchanged. There is an exchanging. Everybody gets exchanged, he says, one way or the other. In a moment, is how it happens, verse 52, how fast, in the twinkling of an eye and at the last trumpet. All right. At the last trumpet. Didn't we just see this, you Revelation people, on Wednesday nights? Yep. Revelation, the 11th chapter, and verse 15. It's the blowing of the seventh trumpet, isn't it? It's the blowing. And 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 uh, the beginning of Revelation and the end of Revelation says all of the contents in between here are to take place quickly. They are to happen soon. They are at hand. And so 11.15 says, Then the seventh angel sounded. That's the last trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven declaring a specific thing. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. And then down in 18, it talks about the fact that the nations are being... um, are being judged. God's wrath has come upon them. They're being judged uh, also to reward your bond servants, the prophets, and the saints. That's the Bema Seat judgment. That's 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10 and also 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 12 through 15. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 right there. So all that is happening there. This, is, this last trumpet is also, by the way, 1 Thessalonians 4. Four and verse oh, 15 and 16. Yeah, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. That's the last trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. See, this is the passage that people look at and they think it's... They think it, They insert this ridiculous unbiblical rapture idea of bodies flying off the surface of the ground. Uh, There's no Bible for that whatsoever. That's made up. That's comic book stuff. And instead, he says the dead will rise first. Well, what's that? What's rise? It's resurrection. It's to be raised. It's 1 Corinthians 15 verse... Thank you, Josh. How old are you, son? How old are you? You're seven years old. And in all these adults, you spoke up first. Good job. I'm ashamed. (laughs) Good job. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 38. God gives it a body just as he wills, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. So when he says right here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the trumpet of God sounds and the dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive and remain, so those in the first century that that are alive, they remain. They will be arpazo, seized, not caught up. There is no Greek here for the word up. That's inserted. It's inserted because of a prejudice. They think that this is some sort of a rapture. This is talking about being seized to God in resurrection. There's no difference between this and what we're studying in 1 Corinthians 15 and all that section right there from verse 36 all the way down to really 57, I believe it is. Then we who are alive and remain will be seized together with them in the clouds. That's a reference to in the divine to meet the Lord in the air, which has, is the Greek word ear, which means the arena of respiration, that which is within you. You can check that out in Kittles. You can check it out in Strong's. Let's see. In Strong's, it's, uh, it's number 109, entry 109, in the Greek dictionary in the back or in your, in your electronic gizmos. Tap, tap, tap. So he meets them in the clouds, in the ear, within, so, with the result being, so we shall always be with the Lord. That understanding of always being with the Lord and never being away from him comes from this fact right here, comes from this first century resurrection. That's why you have that that inside of you right now, that determination, that that determined category of I know I will always be with the Lord because this already happened. If it didn't happen, you wouldn't have that. You wouldn't have that sense of assurance within you. So I'm trying to hurry this up and make sure we get done here. All right, back to 1 Corinthians 15. 
And finally, verse 52, he says, In a moment it happens in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. That means a body has been given. Verse 38, yes? Raised imperishable, and we will be alasso, exchanged. To give or take in exchange, Kittle says. So that's the resurrection body and the exchange, which leads us to the resurrection body that is put on. Now, here's this idea of putting on over now, verse 54. But, excuse me, 53. For this perishable, that's our earthly body, yes? Is perishable the earthly body? Okay, how come you're all unsure now? Is perishable this earthly body? Yeah. For this perishable must put on... This explains the exchange, okay? Must put on the imperishable. What's the imperishable? Your heavenly body, body, correct. And this mortal, that which is at the point of death, must put on immortality. See, you don't have immortality yet until you are in your resurrection body. You don't have it until that takes place. 54. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's Isaiah 25, 8. Isaiah 25, 8. Well, what is this victory? This, this, see, death that is swallowed up in victory. Look. This is talking about the Adamic death right here. This is Romans 5, 12 through 19. Romans 5, 12 through 19. You get this victory once the body is on. You don't have this victory of death being swallowed up yet until you are in your resurrection body. Then you get it. He says in 55, lastly, our resurrection body that makes us victorious. Look at this. He quotes now out of Hosea 13, 14. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And then he answers his own question. The sting of death is sin. See, the sting of death is not death. It's sin. That's what Adam did. That's Romans 5, 12. And the power of sin is the law. (laughs) Man, throughout Romans, especially the seventh chapter, it's the law that makes us violate and makes us sin. That's the power of sin. But, 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How does He give us the victory? How does He give us the victory? Look, I'm tired right now, but i got just enough energy to stand here for another hour. How does He give us the victory? No, nope. I took it back. You were on the road, but not quite there. Let's, let's try it again. How does he give us the victory? Through what means? That's it. Ding, ding, ding. Resurrected bodies. Once you are raised, once you leave this body, your spirit is now unclothed and we must put on the imperishable, which is the body he gives us out of heaven, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, which... Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 38 says, God gives us to the body and each of the seeds a body of its own. It's when we have that body that we have this victory and death is no longer able to sting us. I mean, sure, physical death isn't either because it's an incorruptible, imperishable body, right? So thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we've got a little Trinitarian economic viewpoint that's going on right here in 57. The thanks goes to God, the Father, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So He is the heavenly. He is the last Adam, right? He was first natural, then the spiritual, and then we get what He has relative to to that body, and along with that, the victory over death, over sin, over its sting, through our Lord Jesus Christ. But it's only when you are in your resurrection body. So, wrapping it up then, wrapping it up then. 
Under this question, which is the title, what is the nature of your resurrection body, we find, first of all, that in comparing our resurrection bodies with our earthly bodies, Paul shows that the earthly body cannot be a part of the resurrection body. That's just as clear as could possibly be. See, it's only when you approach the text with presuppositions of this body being raised that you begin to have to reinterpret all of these other texts that are plain on their face. Secondly, our resurrection body is like Christ's resurrection body in all spiritual attributes. In other words, spiritual and heavenly, he's saying here. And so relative to comparing our resurrection body to Christ, we share in the same spiritual attributes. Third and finally, we found out that our earthly body is exchanged, alasso, for the heavenly body which comes out of heaven. Which said resurrection gives us the victory over death in all of its physical and spiritual aspects. That's why this body has to be powerful, because you are overcoming death through this victory. And I don't see why anybody would want to go back to a point of view of resurrection that has it this body being raised. Don't want it. I want what God has for me. I want you to have what God has for you. And so, Father, with all of these things in our minds and in our hearts, how we bless you and praise you for the truth of thy word, how you that you take time, Lord, to patiently draw us back to the right understanding of the word by by casting aside those points of view which just delimit us, Lord God, from having a right understanding, in this case, of resurrection. Lord, I know we went kind of fast today, but would you help all of us, Lord, uh, to, to be able to uh, be reminded and go back to the meaning of what it means to have this Christ-like, resurrected, non-carbon-based body that gives us the victory. Lord God, enable us to be able to explain it to someone else. Come Holy Spirit and empower us and ready us to be ready to give that answer to anybody who asks us of this hope that lies with in us. Let us do it with humility, O God. Let us do it with that. And we thank you, Lord God. I praise you. Let all my brothers and sisters here at Messiah, as well as our friends that are watching on YouTube, it be enabled to grasp, Lord, the length and depth and breadth and height of what the believer's resurrection body is. May they test all things and hold fast to that which is good and perfect. Thank you, O God, for this today.